so you know, get the money away from Paul. And so, <laughs> so he had all those, you know, I think that in the first three days he had something like 400,000 people sign up on his website uh, to, to get that money. And I, and I actually wrote something about that in the book because, you know, normally if there was a functioning FEC, uh, and, and it was functioning when he probably came up with that plan. He could have asked for an advisory opinion of the FEC because that's one thing that they generally are able to do is to give people advice as to whether or not some you know plan that they have um, is consistent with the law. But that wasn't done. I know he said he had agents and lawyers say that it was okay. But I'm not so sure that's true. But in any case, I mean, he brought some attention to the issue, but not enough. I think that the way to bring attention is, uh, somebody mentioned in the event that I, I was in this morning, that all these people in Congress talk about how they spend their entire days instead of working on policy trying to dial for dollars and not and get money for one another to fund them. Um, and I think if people can see and are told about the connections, because there are always connections of direct line of money and policy, but if people see them, if they're told about them, if, are, are you in the press, if you're taking notes, press is, the press is so important. That it was really important in this to start, you know, digging into these things and ferreting them out because there's so little press left to do that. But um, it, you know, some of you may have seen. I know it's been shown a lot of times in uh, in New Hampshire, the movie Dark Money um, that I had a cameo in. But it's really about. Money. Um, and it, it's, there, was a, there was a reporter in it who really was the star, um, and he, he was able to make connections and fair things out, and he did some work even for the local Montana Campaign um, Ethics Commission that was amazing to, to give them a lot of documentation and get it out to the public. I think it's things like that when people, you know, figure things out and think that there might be some issue. Because unless, I've come sort of concluded that unless it's personal to people, unless they understand that this is the reason why you have to work two jobs, or this is the reason, you know, why the roads look like they do, or something that they experience in their everyday life. That's what it's going to be. Yeah, as far as that, I mean, I, I was also curious about the public desire for alternatives. I mean, I'm sure maybe some people in this room are doing it to a presidential campaign, and you're borderline harassed via email every day, and those candidates who brag about small donors are pulling from the same shrinking pile of donors, or even like the Hawkins Dollars Plan Jill Brand was modeling hers off of in Seattle, had like a I think it was like a single digit percent participation rate right. by the public. They spent all this money, like literally mailing people, you know, the instructions and forms on how your vote will help get money out of politics, and people just threw it away. It was annoying. So yeah. that, that's more the pressure mm -hmm. I was curious Yeah. About. Well, I should say, um, I'm running for office in California, and I have seen this firsthand, and I have. Um, and Citizens United as a supporter. Um, and they send ideas <coughs> to their loyal following. And you know, every day I get a dollar here and five dollars there, um, which is great. And I believe in small dollar donors. But when you have an expensive campaign, unless you're really inflammatory and something you do something like, you know. I don't think she got small dollar donors, but like what Kamala did, you know, attacking Biden and then that got her tons of contributions and whatever. I think unless you do stuff like that, 
it's hard to even get small small dollar donors, and you, it's hard to get enough. Um, that's one reason why I do believe that there needs to be some kind of um, public financing system. It's really terrible that President Obama decided he didn't want to use the federal public financing system, which left McCain in the lurch because he had promised to do it and he's kept it, doing it, and Obama raised so much more money. It does take money to run. I mean, it, it does, unfortunately. And so there's got to be some sort of balancing. And, and having public financing at least gives the opportunity, I think, for, and, and maybe not, well, it worked for the presidential, too, at, at one point. But, you know, it, it gives the opportunity for somebody like, well, I guess Kirsten Gillibrand is, you know, had a lot of money, too. But it allows people who normally would run for office to be able to run. And it allows sometimes, especially in the voucher program and some of those other programs, it gets people involved in political campaigns or in at least the, the issues, the body politic, which I think is really important, the civic engagement aspect of it, because I once, um, I, do you all remember when they had the, uh, I think it was the earthquake in Haiti, um, and you could go to the Starbucks and text money to the relief. And there were studies that showed that people who did that, whether they texted 10 bucks or whatever, that they became very involved in what was going on in the, in the, in the relief. And they would get their family, some friends to get involved. And I think the same thing is true for civic engagement in campaigns. That if you, even if you, and I know there's a high voting turnout here, but how many people actually volunteer or give money, I think once you give that 10 bucks, you're invested in that person's success and you're much more interested in the issues. So all of that, I think, makes those kinds of programs get as a way of saying I'd like to comment on the comment about uh, the stunt that giving away money is a stunt. Um, what could be more of a stunt than saying you're going to give it an unnecessary tax cut to millions of Americans? That's a money, that's giving out money, and it was unnecessary. It was given to the wrong people. So that's the biggest stunt that's been pulled. So I wouldn't call Andrew Yang or anybody else a stunt. They're just a minor player in this little game. But they're probably more honest and naive about it. Right. But the big stunt was an unnecessary tax cut. Yeah, I agree. Sorry. I had a comment on that. I just don't want that go. Yeah. Because I know yeah. you can't do otherwise. So. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think um, it, it's funny. I, it did get a lot of people after my article and all I did was question the legality of it. And it, it, it's not for me to decide on, um, you know, stunt versus bet not stunt. But, you know, I always believe that people should try to make sure that it complies with the law. And that law, I didn't enact, but there were a lot of very angry gang people on, on Twitter. But, you know, it, it's, I, I agree with you. I mean, obviously, if you're comparing um, evils in the electoral process or generally in democracy, it doesn't <coughs>
because he didn't say anything that would apply to them. It, in the movie Brexit, if you've seen it, they interviewed people who had been approached because of a Cambridge Analytic. These are people who had never been spoken to before. These are people who had been basically forgotten by the system. Politicians from around spoke to them and got them to come out to vote in. They voted for it was because they were spoken to and told, well, told lies, but they were told that, you know, this was in. So as far as it goes, one other thing about campaign finance reform, if you want to call a politician and actually get the politician's ear, if you're not going to go to the money, the politician doesn't want to talk to you because they have to spend a lot more time trying to get money. And if you're not a donor, why should they talk to you? It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. And isn't that the problem? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's the yeah. right. So what's being said there when the public politicians working for campaign finance? I don't hear anybody talk about it. What the incentive should be. Should be for an incumbent politician to right. change the system. Um, yes, well, you're right. Um, a lot of incumbent politicians um, don't care about those issues, but many do. I, mean, there, I know there are many in Congress. Um, Sardines is one, uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, Amy Klobuchar. Um, a bunch of them are really concerned about these issues. And I know when I mentioned it this morning, um, the Congressman, I think his name is Steve Israel, actually left Congress um, and wrote an op-ed in the New York Times saying, I'm living in disgust because I came to do public policy. I came to do things that were good for the community and I'm spending all my day trying to raise money in this little room where I have to do call time all day long. And they all do, in fact. And so, and there's a whole um, group that has been set up, a, a you know, reform group called Issue One that was started just based on that issue because they were a bunch of very disgruntled Congress people. So there are some, I mean, there are a lot of people go into that one work um, because they actually want to make change, because they actually care about their communities and are dismayed that that's not what it's ending up being. So uh, don't be such a cynic.
That was just that. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, they, at, at the end of the day, they need voters. Reeks of pollution and corruption. And, um, because it goes to the fact that the courts deny it. Yeah, I, I think that that's really a good way to go because I mean, I think back, and for those of you who haven't seen the movie, Montana actually, after Citizens United was, was uh, uh, enacted, they brought a case to the Supreme Court and said, hey, Montana's law um, that's been in existence since 1900 because they had big mining interests that essentially were so corrupt and you know decimated part of the countryside and were you know buying the seats in the legislatures and so they enacted the laws about corporate contributions, independent and direct. And um, one of the I think it was a co group who took it to the uh, uh, appealed it to the Supreme Court and they said, look, we have a history of corruption. This is why we have this law. And you can't, you know, you can't apply it to us. And the Supreme Court, in like a paragraph decision, said, no, we affirm the other citizens united. And it was really obnoxious, which is what gave me the idea that if someone came with today's corruption and had lots of um, evidence of it, that, that it would be maybe affected. Ten years after the rule. Right, exactly. So if we're looking at campaign finance and how people raise money, that's one way to approach reform. But to level the playing field, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on limiting campaign spending, yeah. uh, which would alleviate, you know, would give people a threshold where they could stop right, with phone calls and, and mm -hmm. people out. Yeah, well, the court doesn't permit it. Um, you cannot limit campaign spending unless that's you... First amendment. Yes, that, that's what um, early on, the early decisions were that um, people, which, which drives me wild actually, but the people, you know, it's, it's a, they didn't actually say money is speech, but what they said was speech enabled, or speech is enabled, by money, and so you cannot limit um, the ability of people to um, utilize the money to get the word out about their campaigns. And the, the, the worst case, someone someone mentioned it today, but different in it this morning, but in it, it's actually not exactly how that case was decided. It was a there was a, um, a public funding uh, scheme in Arizona. This is called the Bennett case versus Arizona. And they were, you know, famously, a woman got elected governor in Arizona who, she, she told me personally, she would never have gotten elected unless they had this kind of funding um, because she ran against an incumbent. Um, and they had a provision in it that said uh, if the opponent Cell funds or gets a lot of IEs that is way higher than what the funding program is, that they will bump it up to make it competitive. And the court said that was a violation of the wealthy person's First Amendment rights. So, <laughs> so there you go. So that was struck down. <laughs> so. I just want uh, one, one comment because this can kind of press me. <laughs> but there is something I think where I'm just having been working on this for quite a while. Uh, one of the things that has definitely changed is that people understand the system is real. Really people want to do something about that. So I think that's been a very positive development. Before we were kind of in the Reagan esque, you know, governance the problem, and people now have shifted it. 
and your understanding of corporate power and rigging of that. Uh, one question which I think you've already answered in terms of your uh, assessment of the Supreme Court is what if you try to approach it from the donation side, <coughs> speech non decision, which is not a Supreme Court decision, and you challenge the their uh, determination that you can't limit the contributions to independent exemptions. Right. Um, I think that it won't change. Because, yeah, I know you <laughs> because ultimately they're talking about the speech that's going to be, that it's going to be utilized. But if you could technically shut off making contributions, if it's a court by the court, you give you 10 million bucks, then you would, you would be in a way shutting off the flow of the expenditures. Yeah. I just wondered if you had any um, insights or thoughts on how the money in politics would play if we had term limits. You know, I think that you mean term limits in Congress uh, in all or in all the right. level level um, positions. You know, I'm not sure that that would change it. And, and this is the reason. There are term limits in California in the legislature. Um, and there is nonetheless an enormous amount of money that is spent independently from corporate groups, from unions, from you know all the all the independent organizations, as well as money in the in the races. And it's because what you find is that people um, then go from position to position. So there's a lot of, uh, they, they're not just going to stay uh, in the state senate, they're then going to go back to the board of supervisors and then they're going to come back and go to the assembly and then they're maybe going to run to Congress and they can keep using all that money um, that are in their campaigns for all the next races. So it doesn't, it doesn't well, and I also just realized that the various donors might just sort of donate to a seat as well. <coughs> It doesn't matter that the person in the seat is, is rotating or Right, because they, they have their company or whatever in that, in that place. Working for the Board of Supervisors, I think this, this might be um, obvious to people in the room, but I don't know the answer to this. How do you get the general population to understand the significance of campaign finance reform. How do you get them to see what it's doing rather than like, see a, a plan to get a man on the moon? But campaign finance reform seems a little um, uh, theoretical. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, I think one of the problems is the messaging hasn't been very good. Because when you talk about campaign finance reform, nobody knows what that means. And it really doesn't mean anything as an abstract. I mean, I, I think the gentleman who talked about it being rigged, I, if that is true. I mean, we know Trump used that in his campaign. And it resonated with people. I mean, it's things like that that I think people understand. It's like, wait. Here's the reason why you are having to work two jobs. Here's the reason why your children go to a bad school when the kids across the town have a much better school. If things like that, that's the only way I think that it's going to um, resonate with people, is if it's personal. 